Welcome, everyone. My name is Gus Capriva. We're from the Redbud Art Center. And I want to welcome, welcome every one of you. It's always, it's always sad to lose someone, especially a legend like Wayne Gilbert. But Beverly, uh, I don't know where you are. I can't see that far. But uh, this just shows the, the support and the care of the people in this area and you know, the care about uh, Wayne Gilbert. So it's, uh, it's quite a testament. We were going to do this at Red Bud, and we were advised by several close friends not to do it there because we, couldn't, we didn't have the capacity. And I can, we made the right decision. And I apologize for those guys that are standing, but uh, there's some seats upstairs also. Uh, the agenda, make a brief, I'll make a brief introduction. We'll, then we'll have a, uh, a 25 minute or so film by Ramsey Telly, the top filmmaker in the United States that uh, teaches at Pratt in New York. Then after the film, we'll have some sentiments of various friends and associates of Wayne Gilbert. And then we'll open it up uh, for uh, sentiments from the audience. We have the space for two hours. And uh, we're attempting to start on time and keep on schedule, because Wayne would have liked it that way. <laughs> we were going to hold this in a church. <laughs> but I was advised <laughs> that the gods would smite this all down. So I want to thank the Kessler Group to uh, loaning us the use of this wonderful space. And so I'm going to start out. Uh, Sharon and I owned this place before selling it eight, nine years ago for 30 years. And this place has quite a history, and I don't know. Wayne and I, we, we always love to tell stories, and he loved the story of this place. And he, he was here when it was a gallery in the, in the early 2000s and so on. And a lot of people do not know the full story of the Heights Theater. This was the site of the first suburban cinema. It showed silent films. And then in the early 30s, it was the first, one of the first air-conditioned theaters in Houston. So for years, it served as a neighborhood theater, and many, many people spent their childhood here. And even uh, some of the illustrious people that went here, besides Lyndon Baines, Johnson, and Dan Rather, and so on, was Bonnie and Clyde. And Bonnie and Clyde lived a few blocks down on Harvard, and they, were, they moved every three months because you know, half, the, half the Midwest and Texas were, were, were looking for them. But they attended this theater. And the stories are that they actually made love in that balcony over there. <laughs> Doing one of the uh, Tom Mix film, cowboy films. So I always thought that was a great story. Flash forward, 1968 during one of our another useless wars, uh, the owners of the film decided to show an international film. I Am Curious Yellow. It was a triple X. Today it's probably PG-13. <laughs> but, but it was, they actually showed frontal nudity in 68. The owners made $3,000 that night, going from a cowboy film to triple X. And that night, after the first showing, and the cameras are still in the audience back there, in the foreground, um, it was either the Klan or the Projectionist Union, because this place was non-union, and they torched the place. 
So they filled it, the roof with flammables, and it caught fire. And it literally destroyed the theater, except the walls, the floor, and the facade. So flash forward, 87, it was a wreck. Sharon and I purchased the place. We put a roof on it, and we had live theater for many years, and it turned into a gallery, an antique store, and so on. And then it was, uh, it was purchased by the Kester Group in 2015, and they had the means and the foresight to turn this into one of the top music venues in the city. And uh, I'm so grateful for them for allowing us to be here. So, in addition, this place is haunted. <laughs> now, Wayne Spirit, I'm convinced, is here because <laughs> he's allowing me to talk. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, as an engineer, I, 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 uh, I'm open to the idea that spirits exist because I've heard so many stories about this place. At two o'clock on Saturday morning, a lady in white goes from that door to the front. And I've had several people, including some of my relatives that have stepped, slept here when they didn't have any place to stay, that this place is haunted. And it's still haunted. I, don't, I haven't seen the ghost lately, but uh, it, it's quite something. So I just want to give you a little history about this place. And Wayne, Wayne loved the stories. We, we always told stories to each other. And so I think I'll, I'll shut up for now, and, and uh, we'll introduce Ramsey Telly, an award-winning filmmaker, teaches at Pratt, and first ran in him in a rubber group in the early 2000s. And he, he is... He is uh, his last show at Redbud, he, he took a, a day out to film Wayne. So this is the last, you'll be looking at the last interview uh, that Wayne Gilbert gave on film. So it's quite something. I haven't seen it, so this is, this is a world premiere. And this theater for years was the home of this, the, the Sunday afternoon matinee. So pretend when the lights go out, that you're at the matinee at the Heights Theater again. Thank you, folks. I would, if I did describe Wayne Gilbert's work in one word. I'm prone most to saying provocative because I do hear other people respond to the provocation. And I know people who can handle a lot of awfully weird ass work who get freaked out. Well, actually, it was about 1986. And uh, what happened to me was that I got sober uh, as an alcoholic and drug addict, and a few years later decided to go back to the University of Houston and get take art lessons, because I began to draw at home and realized that I could draw. So I went back and got my degree in art, and then, uh, then that was where it all began, actually. Control camera. 1.2 Baker, take one, Mark. Quiet, Quiet on the set, everyone. Yes, sir. Ready? Action. Action. I'm kind of a celebrity now, you know. Thank God all the young people had enough sense to understand the quality of good art. The old people, hell, they're yesterday smashed potatoes, so I don't give a shit about them anymore. But, whoa, wait a minute. Let's just get through the bullshit here and talk about how beautiful you are. And maybe, if I'm lucky, I'll be able to get you to go outside with me a little while and get a little fresh air. What do you think, babe? You up for it?
anyway, it, 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 it's kind of hard to really put your finger on it. it, it it's making movies for me is like kind of being alive and around the world with people and doing things in the moment. It's, you know, kind of because 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 if I do that, what happens is is that I find out that we have what is a real movie, not some fucking thing made up that everybody has spent a trillion dollars and didn't end up with a decent movie because I mean it, it, my movies are about people and life and, you know that kind of thing just just stuff that it's worth being a part of and, and if it works fine if it doesn't well fuck it I don't give a shit at the end of the day who gives a fuck Nobody does. you know I kind of like to really kind of maybe put you in a movie if I could but you know we'll just see what happens in the meantime I guess we better go home what do you think let's just go home And he saw the absurd in all of us. He saw, you know, the absurd of being just being a human being and trying to navigate your way through this. And uh, he saw it at a very young age, I think. Wayne, his art is more or less about excitement. I don't like to think that I'm a social painter because I don't know if I really am. I'm probably more of a fuck you painter than I am anything else. He's a great personality. So anyway. <laughs> as far as his talent, he is a fantastic painter. <laughs> I do this all with a sense of humor, you know, because I realize you have to have a sense of humor or you can't exist. And, and I mean, most of it, by virtue of my observation of absurdity, it allows me to have that sense of humor because at the beginning, at the end of it all, beginning and the end of it all, it's all really a, a large joke. Uh, and I'm not sure who the joke's on. Texas art is basically a type of a respectability thing, you know. They're trying to be re respectable more than anything else, you know. To not be laughed at. I mean, that would be the ambition of normal Texas art. Of, Don't laugh at me, you know. I'm very serious. <laughs> So, they are very refreshing, they're going against this, they realize this official art is dead of just having the art supplies as, a, as the thing you judge, yet they do use art supplies in their own way. I'm always on the lookout for some new way to do a little change, to make a little corner turn. And it finally came to me on the 610 loop that I could use human ashes in my paintings. People's reactions to this experience of using these human remains have been varied. So this is dead bodies? I thought, well, that's great. That's sort of like a, a gimmick that he's using, you know. In some ways it ends up being a gimmick, and I don't argue with that, because in the world we live in today, gimmickry is an element. Gimmick it just means a style which is not appreciated by the person looking at it. I mean, modern art is stuck with billions of gimmicks, like Jackson Pollock's Britain paint off a stick, number one gimmick after World War II. And it was even called a gimmick, you know, by Time Magazine and various officials until finally, at a certain point, you get the right people behind it and stop being a gimmick. It becomes an art style. Wayne Gilbert, I'm going to ask you a question. Off the top of your head, what would you say to a very young, almost child artist? Mm, man, don't get in this business. <laughs> it was a beautiful day, sun beat down, 
I had the radio on. I was driving. Trees went by. Me and Dell were singing. A little runaway. I was flying. Yeah, running down a dream that never would come to me. Working on a mystery. Going wherever it leads. Running down a dream. I felt so good. Like anything was possible. Hit cruise control. Last three days, and the rain was unstoppable. It was always cold, no sunshine. of rubber in Houston was a very hard thing to determine. Those that liked it, loved it. Those that sort of liked it were okay with it. And those that didn't like it, didn't like it. Wayne and Bill have some, a little bit of, of the ability to be a bad boy, to be not approved of. It's just difficult for a lot of people. So they're bringing freshness into the art scene by being willing to not be approved of. And it can be fun, you know, it can be fun. Prosperity is limited, but it can be fun. Three, Charlie, take three, Mark. Action. I mean, look around you. They're all over the goddamn place. They're crawling all over the place. I mean, after all, just... Cut. Uh, remember... Five, Limbo, take one, Mark. Action. Look around you. They're all over the fuck. Five, Delta, take one, Mark. Action. Now look around you, goddamn it. They're all... Look at them. They're crawling all over... Five, Killer, take three, Mark. Rolling. <clears throat> like, what the fuck is any of this? A bunch of assholes with a bunch of leotards acting like this shit's all meaningful or something. Who gives a shit? Five limbo, take one, Mark. Action. I mean, look around you. They're all over the fucking place. I mean, it's everywhere. God damn, you can't miss them. Shit, look around. Excellent. It's a funny story one time. Wayne was telling a story here at Redbud. In walked our gallery dog, a Peruvian hairless named Pluto. But while Wayne was talking, 
he interrupted his speech and said, Gus, your dog is peeing on me. And of course, silence. Then everybody laughed. And then the dog nonchalantly walked off and left him. And that's how Pluto claimed Wayne Gilbert. And Wayne Gilbert was claiming Pluto in, in that regard. And I thought it was a, a great story. Wayne had always said that uh, he liked a lot of animals more than he liked a lot of humans. So there's some truth to that. We met at a, I think it was either a Catholic or an Episcopal church. I think it was Catholic at Maine and Holman in Houston in an AA meeting. And uh, I think Wayne shook more than me. <laughs> and uh, it was instant, absolute instant attraction. There was this freedom that usually only wealthy, wealthy people get. He was unafraid to be himself, and people loved him for it. Yeah, Wayne was very unpredictable. You never knew what he was going to do, but it was very exciting, and it was kind of like a Wild West show. Wanna be a cowboy, sweetheart? Wanna learn to rope and ride? Wanna ride over the plains and the desert, southwest of the great divide? Wanna hear the coyotes howling while the sun sets in the west? I wanna be a cowboy, sweetheart, like the other bass. but she still loved him. You could get just, you know, disagree, get mad, but love him because he was so lovable. And you could see that twinkle in his eye and that excitement about his life, you know, about being alive, about going somewhere. One thing about Wayne's mind is it's always kind of ticking. And usually there is a connection. There is never a sense that he's lost sight of his material when he's creating his images. Um, he did this talk at our museum maybe two years back, and he brought in this giant painting that was meant to be hung all four different ways and different faces appeared in the course of it. And I was like, I thought it was such a strange piece until he sort of pointed out these details, like the baby ash over here and this, and I'm like, okay, this is all about the tumult of mankind and the fact that no matter how we keep tossing and turning and dealing with political and social and religious affiliations, this thing ultimately comes down to this, you're made of a bunch of chemicals, you put food in an engine and it burns. Uh, all of the really primal information about being human. He is asking these questions and he wants us to ask these questions because other, other these questions are not being asked and it's not just that other artists don't ask these questions, other Society doesn't really ask these questions. It's an entirely different energy. It's it's uh, it, it's it's not exactly releasing 
the soul back to the universe. Uh, but it's, uh, it's transforming it into something else, into something that's, that's, that's gonna go on in some way, which is a, it's a very different stance on what death is uh, and what, uh, you know, how we relate to the dead and to, and to honor them. I mean, I think it's as, you know, it's as much of an honoring as, as you know, especially with these anonymous, you know, these anonymous people that aren't claimed. By his own definition, they are sort of a testament to those that have been left behind and unclaimed. Uh, and then I think the, the messaging in the visual narrative is that of like Greek plays. They're just elemental stories very easy to grasp and yet have great, you know, meaning in, in our world and they're very rich. Wayne Gilbert does not traffic in irony. One might think so at first, again, because of the pop art nature, but actually it's not ironic. It's a straightforward critique of consumer culture. It's a straightforward uh, questioning of what is important and what is not. And first and foremost, I think people are uncomfortable with the fact that the um, cremains that he uses are of people who have been completely abandoned by their family, who, whose remains have never been picked up. Maybe people couldn't afford it, maybe they forgot. Uh, this is a social issue, the abandonment of the elderly, the breakdown of the nuclear family. This is why I think in years to come, historians will look at Wayne Gilbert's work and see that it's multidimensional. There are many sociological factors that could contribute to a, a, a wide spectrum of meaning behind his work. My vision of the work was a little bit fogged at first by the, the material. And I think, but why, and my question was, why put so much emphasis on the material when it's really the ability to create form that is number one? And each painting he's taken as, an, each section of the painting is almost a different task. You know, these are elements that he does individually and then they're put together in such a way that you get the full statement. And that statement is, it, it's complex, but it feels very, it's as complex as our present is now. It's easier to think about the past because we've already edited most of it out. It's hard to think about the present because everything's happening at once. And that's where, it, that's what I get out of his work, a, a real intimacy with the present. And that's the essence of contemporary art. Contemporary art being different than modern art of the past or 20th century art. This is the 21st century, and I think what he has to say is really that. He's really bringing us into a century where death is an everyday experience, but where the man's imagination, his creative powers go beyond it. We're driving in the car. I'm in the back seat. He's in the front seat, and she's sitting beside. And he started telling her, we're going to go to the Colombian restaurant I love. And I went, oh, that's awful. I started, I started um, really carrying on like, you know, someone would want to get a gun out and shoot you, you know. But I say, that's awful. Oh, it's just, it's just fat, fat, uh, sour, uh, what is it called, salt? Salt belly, what is it called? That pork belly, it's real popular now. Full of pork belly and greasy steaks and french fries and egg on, raw egg on top. It's hideous. And Wayne finally said, <laughs> he said, God damn it, shut up, Beverly. <laughs> I just went like that. <laughs> and Pat was, she was like, I don't even remember what was said, but the first thing that came out, and the first thing that I thought of was, you're in trouble now. <laughs> Do you have any last words for planet Earth? Of what? The planet Earth. 
No, I can't. No, my, my last words are thank you for the trip. Okay. What do you think? That's good. Get some stuff you can use? Yeah. Cool. Still, it's, it's good sound bites in there. Cut. Cut. If you try to stop for a second and actually observe the infinity of the universe and the, and the weird hugeness of everything and then apply yourself to being a little creature on a little earth and then try to say for a minute that you have some profound knowledge of the fucking world, I mean, come on now. So I say that it is all a mystery, purely, simply a mystery. That's funny. That's great. <laughs> That's the right for that. <laughs> That's the answer to the whole thing right there. Yeah. A lot of people knew Wayne as an artist and a businessman and a marathon runner and a golfer and God knows what else. But he was also, as, a, as the Renaissance man that he was, he was a poet. And we're gonna have uh, Stan Crawford read uh, several of his uh, poems that are, I don't know if they've ever been read before in public, but here goes, Stan Crawford. I uh, met Wayne and Beverly in 2000 through my wife Dawn, who had known them since the late 80s. And Beverly did me the honor of asking me to read uh, a few of Wayne's poems uh, today, so I'm gonna read three. His poems tend to fall into one of two categories. They're either charms or curses. <laughs> this first one is a curse. To the roommate's damn dog. 
named after a literary figure, Harper Lee of To Kill a Mockingbird, I would have hoped that you, of all dogs, and on behalf of your bookish existence, would appreciate and respect the page and not chew the spines of my books, four now in total, and scatter the words and stories that once filled my evening hours throughout the house. I wish for you that someone destroy the things you love <laughs> and gnaw them wet with drool and shred them beyond repair. I wish for you that this destroyer of goodness show no guilt and no apology. Finally, I wish you a room full of books, a library for your doghouse, where the shelves are stocked with only hardcover copies of To Kill a Mockingbird. <laughs> and all day these books surround you, tower over you, and beckon to you, but you cannot devour these books because if you were to consume them, you would find yourself gnawed and wet and shredded like the books you eat, because now your literary self and your physical self are one. <laughs> the second uh, poem of the three I'm gonna read is both a blessing, uh, a charm, and a curse and it's titled, Ode to the Blessings of the Charmed Curse. Open the window so I can get some air. I will rest now and feel the breeze of time as it calls to me to remove my youth from its bondage and set free the memories I cannot seem to forget. The great marathon has left my legs quivering and my Thor has softened. I want to go back and feel the fragrance of young sex and wild money and endless, reckless disregard for the other fucking people in the world. <laughs> the competition is wild and wonderful, and I can beat them all with my fucking intellectual prowess and stubborn, self-centered, and selfish desire. Get out of my way, you. But here I am, sitting by the last fire of winter, listening to the faint putter of my pacemaker. <laughs> this last poem is Charm for the Creator. If you should see a work of beauty, painted, molded, or written, speak softly. Though cranberry stains of foolish moments dripping down and holding fast, nothing can be done to remove this gift. Understand nothing but this. Should this work of beauty turn ugly when time robs its proportion, say loudly, this stain that removes itself from us is also the death of you, my friend, who is seen with eyes, heard with ears, to deny that gift. Understand nothing of life but this. When these words are spoken, you will understand there is nothing in life but art. Thank you, Wayne. Rahul, are you, are you here? You're next. With some sentiments from uh, Toby Camp, I believe, yes. from Germany. Hi. So before I read what Toby sent, I want to say a word about Wayne. We all know how energetic and how interesting he was. I hate to say was. You know, I always feel that he is still with us here. I met him like about 20 years ago. I think I met Gus and Wayne. I uh, walked into then uh, G Gallery um, with my paintings to show him. And interestingly, I think he said, like, oh, these are fantastic. Can you do a show next month? <laughs> I was like, what? I can Then I said, yes, you know. I said, yes, of course I can do it. So I did. In fact, I think it was one of the most interesting things because that's how Wayne was, like, you know, 
He's like, oh yeah. Uh, he said, oh, let's go to India and do a show. I'm like, yes, uh, when? Uh, maybe next year. He said, no, 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 three months from now. <laughs> and not only that, uh, let's include about 75 artists from Houston. So that's what we did. We packed everything, rolled into a big thing, and took it there, had a show. And this is how I know Wayne, and that's how, how my family knew Wayne. My kids grew up with him, and they know him dearly, and they miss him dearly. Beverly and Wayne are part of my family. And we kind of like, you know, it's like, you know, my dad died of Alzheimer's, I never cried, but when Wayne died, I couldn't sob. I was sobbing. And this is one of those things. I think, you know, beyond all the shocking and all that, he was very inclusive, very simple, and then he wanted to do everything. And I think he did, you know. Almost everything that he could do and he could not do, he tried to do. <laughs> and I think uh, that's, that's what Wayne is. For me, is a dear friend. I don't think I will ever, uh, you know, get over this feeling that he's gone. I mean, you know, and, and he won't. I mean, he is always with me and with us. Thank you. But now, let me read what one of his other close friends, um, Toby, sent. Wayne and I met once a week for lunch for over 10 years. He would come by and scoop me up in his big Lexus sedan and take me to some interesting place for lunch, a buffet in Little India, Asia Market in the Heights, or a funky old cash-only cafeteria. He drove fast and confidently, switching lanes so gracefully that no turn signal was required. <laughs> Often, while fielding a call from his beloved Beverly, Wayne knew Houston like Dante knew hell, and he loved it. <laughs> we would talk and talk and talk about art, politics, the meaning of life. There was occasionally some swearing. He would fill me in on his projects and experiments, his customized sets and traveler hair hat with the brim diameter reduced ever so slightly, about his outings with the rubber artist group, about his travels around the world, his pre presentation at art schools, galleries, and fairs, and even his flirtation with a mullet hairstyle. <laughs> I remember one ride during which he informed me that he was wearing two different colognes, one on each side, so you could choose which way to angle in on someone. I think, you know, talking about that, Beverly, I think you remember, like in Delhi, he was wearing two colored shoes, right? And a, and a boy, a little boy with a big, you know, what do you call, polishing thing, you know, came up and said like, looked at him and said like, I can make them look the same color. <laughs> <laughs> Where am I? Okay. Um, I absolutely loved the idea, but I confess I had to roll down the window because he had applied these colognes just before I got into the car. Each time we met, Wayne spoke about all the things he was grateful for, his recovery, his life as an artist, his many and varied communities, his graduate studies at Rice University, his good health care. He always spoke with love and admiration about Beverly. Her skill as a business person and their company, and more importantly, the life they'd built together. He was so proud of her and loved her so dearly. I realize now that Wayne, although he was avowed an avowed atheist and practice, was practicing something central to all religions, a kind of gratitude and awe for her, and of world and its mysteries and opportunities. He appreciated every good thing and blessed in his life, blessing and blessing in his life and accepted the negatives as a part of the whole package. He left too soon, but nobody can say he didn't live his life to the fullest. I am taking my memories of Wayne and his vision of how to make the most of our places in the world with me. Wayne was a great friend. I miss him dearly. I wish I could be with you all today to celebrate the memory of this great man. Thank you. Wayne and I, and a lot of us, we, we did at least seven international shows, from Shanghai to Istanbul to Athens, Thessaloniki, Lima, Paris. A lot of you guys were in those shows. 
And one day as a joke, and this is about Wayne's courage, his don't give a damn attitude, which I loved. I said, Wayne, I had a call today from a third party government. I won't mention who it was, but would you be willing to join me in a group of Texas artists doing a show in Tehran? He says, Persia? He says, yeah, Persia. And he says, why not? <laughs> he, had, he had courage. He would never, he would never say no. I could, I, could, I could say we're doing a show on Mars. He'd say, sign me up. <laughs> so anyways, our next speaker is Carl. Well, thank you, Gus. You, you made the curse of my life. I am Chuck Carl Berg. And uh, it's, it's only been 80 years now. So anyway, um, so, so I hope everybody can hear me OK. Um, that film was incredible. I, I, I was you know, tearing up with Beverly down here on the front row. Um, years ago, uh, when we were at a memorial service for another one of our members, uh, I was talking to the priest at the Episcopal Church, and he said, you have to get it right because that person is there. He was serious, and I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I've done a lot of funerals and a lot of memorial services, and they're there, and you better get it right, so we're going to get it right today. How, this can be participatory, by the way. How many people have known Wayne as an artist. Hey, look at that, there we go. How many people know him as a gallery owner? Yeah, there we go. And then how many people, this is to make it smaller, how many people know him as a businessman? Incredible businessman. Okay, and then how many people know him as a salesman? <laughs> he was one of the greatest salesmen I've ever been with. And I've known Wayne 40 plus years because I'm in the advertising business and Wayne would do work for us. And uh, actually he was a salesman for this incredible woman named Beverly Gilbert who would, back when, this is before the digital age and you know, half the room doesn't know what that was, but she would paint on a chrome, an eight by 10 chrome, she would retouch a photo and you didn't even know what was there was there before because she was, a, I don't know what you use, a mink brush or some sort of fine brush, she would retouch things out. and. So Wayne was selling her what, her what she could do like nobody else, and it still exists today in the digital world. But um, the other thing is, how many know Wayne is a spiritual guru? There he was. He was his, his, you heard the mystery and the creativity of his life and uh, what this is all about. Uh, and, and I put down here, how many knew him as a genius? I think he was a genius. I think we, he still is a genius. I put that down here. Um, but to me, I know a, Wayne more than any other thing as my sponsor in AA. And uh, I've got 32 years, thanks to Wayne. Oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 that, <laughs> Wayne had 46, I, I'll never catch him, you know, but uh, we, were, we were outside, this is, we, we play poker a lot, you know, and uh, I, I thanked Wayne, I said, Wayne, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna thank you for saving my life. And Wayne is, is, has humility. He said, I didn't save your damn life. AA did. And I went, okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> but I, I give him credit. And um, he really did. The one last thing I have to say about Wayne, we had lunch a lot. And we, had, we just, and I told, my, I told my wife, Gail, I said, we talked about things that would just go on forever and ever. I'm sure many of you have had that same lunch. But we were in the Galleria one day, and it was a crowded area, and we were talking and talking and talking. And finally, this woman next to us stood up and got got up and left. She said, you goddamn liberals are going to ruin the world. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know about that. But I do thank Wayne. I love the man. And uh, I'm so thrilled that he is here and enjoying this wonderful, wonderful ceremony and things that we're having. This is incredible. And, and I'm sure Wayne is enjoying it as much as we are. Thank you all very much. Our Next settlement will be coming from another Chuck. Chuck Lever. Hi, I'm Chuck Lever. Um, I know, I've known Wayne since uh, 1995. Um, I lived across the street from a person, Martin Thornhill, who came over to my house and he knew I was an alcoholic and 
he told me I had to go to this meeting. And uh, I told him I was doing something else, and he told me that, uh, that he wasn't asking me, he was telling me. And uh, he took me uh, to Wayne's meeting, and that would have been probably in the spring of 1995. And uh, I continued to go to that meeting. Um, and I think the last meeting Wayne had was uh, um, 7.31 um, of this year. Um, he was a dramatic individual. He had an enormous power um, to energize people, to make people feel comfortable. Um, there's a lot of talk about his art today. He loved three or four things. The thing he loved the most was Beverly Gilbert, without a doubt. Um, he loved AA. Um, he believed AA gave him the life to be able to love Beverly, to be an artist. Um, during COVID, Wayne opened his meeting every Monday night for two years and waited there. And you would ask Wayne why he did that. And he said, because if the suffering alcoholic needed a meeting and I weren't there, what would have happened when I went to a meeting and nobody was there? I'd be dead. Why that was so impactful was because Wayne had a serious heart ailment. Beverly told him if he got COVID, he could die. It didn't matter to him. What mattered to him was the suffering alcoholic. Our meeting would begin by Wayne demanding that we would say that our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics achieve sobriety. That was the driving force behind him. He believed that whatever he had was enabled by those people that came before him. He made it the coolest and most unique place to be he loved being able to provide that relief for the alcoholic. But also what he loved to do was to be able to show the alcoholic that life wasn't just about Alcoholics Anonymous, that it was much bigger than that. He would talk about his life in a small apartment in Montrose, driving a Pinto without a fender, to going to where he was around the world. I would receive text messages from him over the years from all different places and the joy that he had in that. And going to AA meetings in those places. He, he was a remarkable individual that's very difficult to understand in Alcoholics Anonymous unless you were a part of those meetings because they were transcendental. He reformed and changed people. He gave them hope people who were lost and forgotten, people that lived on the street, people that went to jail, that now have families, businesses are successful. People that look at them now and say they were an alcoholic, they were a drug addict, those were his people. And I think that's why he chose those cremated remains because those were forgotten people too. And he was always the champion of those. He would stand up for AA. That was what was important to him. His primary purpose was to stay sober and help other alcoholics achieve sobriety. And he did it. I love Wayne and I'll miss him forever, but he will always be in my heart. Meredith, Carol. Hello, I'm Meredith Carroll. And uh, I've got a little cheat sheet because I get nervous up here. And first of all, I want to, when I walked in, I thought everybody would be in bright colored clothes and because Wayne was so on fire with life. So I felt a little uh, weird, but I, I guess that's okay. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, I have known Wayne Gilbert and Beverly since 1980. And in 1981, I got sober and met them in AA. And um, we got to be quick friends really quickly because we really liked each other. We laughed a lot. We went to a lot of meetings together in the early years. And um, some people in the room might remember Wayne had a meeting every single Tuesday night down in the medical center. And it was a big auditorium. And he always had a leader, but he always introduced the leader for about 10 minutes. 
because he always had something wise to say or something he wanted to talk about, and he always made people laugh. And that's what I love so much about Wayne. And he and Beverly were, you know, always together. And, um, you know, Beverly was always kind of quiet and shy and in the background, but everybody knew who was running the show, and it was Beverly. <laughs> yeah, and he knew it too. Uh, <clears throat> But we, and he also did a meeting at St. John's every Saturday morning, some of you might know about, with Red Rogers. And um, the two of them would sit up in the front of that meeting for years and years. I went there for years. And they always sat up there and cracked jokes and, you know, made fun of, you know, not made fun, but made um, tragedies more light because we're all in this deal together. And we could all laugh together. And they taught us, the Waynes and the Red Rogers taught us that we could laugh about our lives. And, um, you know, it's just amazing the people that come into your life, what an important part they play in who you become. And um, we also had a, um, <clears throat> we had a little group of friends we had a lot of fun with in the beginning. And there were four or five different couples. We did a lot of things together. And um, sometimes we'd go golfing. They golfed a lot better than I did. I tried, but they golfed, they golfed okay. And sometimes we even went on golfing trips together, which was always interesting. But we always had a great time, really good time. And I remember one night um, we were on the way back to the hotel from golfing, and Wayne said, i got to stop at the grocery store real quick. I said, well, what do you need? I just need some haagen dazs real quick. Just stay in the car. I'll be right back. <laughs> well, you know, 15, anybody who knows Wayne, and he was totally strung out on ice cream. <laughs> totally strung out. That was his habit of the day. But, and, you know, he didn't want one thing except haagen dazs. I had to go to a store that had haagen dazs. So 10 minutes later, I'm like, okay, I got, I'm going inside, see what he's doing in there. So I said, what are you doing, Wayne? He said, well, all 10 of these cartons have freezer burn on top of them. Look at this. And he opened it up. That's before they had plastic on top. But he opened it. Look at this freezer burn. I can't eat that. He'd close it and put it back. So he went through three or four more, and he said, finally. And he found one without freezer burn, and he bought it. <laughs> but... That was really important to Wayne, but, um, and we also had this gourmet dinner club. We'd all get together, several of us together, and we'd, we'd all take turns picking a restaurant and picking the menu, and, um, you know, the chef would make us a special private di dinner in a private room, and we always had so much fun. So we were into the golf, and we were into AA, and we were a big time into food as well. And uh, <clears throat> we also, um, I did a lot of running for a while with Wayne and Beverly. I'm not a runner anymore, but I was for quite a while. And at one point, they got me to sign up with this, um, this track group over at Rice University, running track. I said, I, that, I don't want to do that. That's way too much work. Oh, no, you can do it. Come on. you got to come do it with us. Well, I tried it, and you know what? Their legs are a lot longer than mine. And track, and it was terrible, but I stuck it out for a while, but I finally had to drop out. But um, <laughs> so, um, you know, for those first several years, this group of people and a lot of other people in AA, we all grew up together. We grew up together. I was 26 years old. Everybody was pretty much our own age, and now look at us. I'm almost 70. But we did. We grew up together, and we learned a lot of things from each other. We were there in good times, bad times, happy times, sad times, when people passed away or people had brand new babies the day... Um, our son Chase came home from the hospital. Wayne and Beverly came right over, and Wayne looked at him and said, oh, he's a cute little thing. And I said, here, you want to hold him? No, no, I don't want to hold him. No, I just want to look at him. <laughs> but he was always so funny. We, Wayne always had everybody laughing, and that I really loved that about him. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, a little years down the road when he really got big into his art, and I'd go over to their house and visit with them, I saw all this stuff on the, if anybody has not been to their home, with the, it looks like an art gallery, you gotta go see it. It's something to see. And I'd walk in and say, I think he liked to see the look, look on my face. Oh, come look at this new one I have. And I'm like, like I don't know what to say. <laughs> some of it was pretty wild and crazy. And then when he got into some of the, um, using the human remains, I thought, man, Wayne's getting really strange. But, but then he, he start, started telling me all about it, and then I realized, you know what? I think that's a fabulous idea, because he was using human remains that nobody picked up, somebody that was left behind and forgotten, and he honored them by putting them in a painting and showing them to other people. So they, in the end, were very much honored, and I, I thought that was a great thing to do. And um, I really respected 
sometimes I didn't quite understand all his art. I thought it was a little strange, but um, I admired his passion for it. And um, he knew my parents as well. My parents were very, um, very straight-laced and very traditional. And every time I'd go to their house, say, hey, when are you bringing your parents over to see my new art? <laughs> oh, never. And they, and they all laughed. Everybody thought that's so funny. Even Beverly was throwing out the character. <laughs> But anyway, um, you know, the people in AA are not a glum lot at all. There are several people in the room here I've known from AA over the years. We are not a glum lot at all. Some of the funniest, smartest, wisest people I've ever met are in AA. And Wayne Gilbert was one. He taught me a lot about being yourself. Just be yourself. Don't pretend to be anybody else. you got to laugh in life. you got to enjoy life. you got to experience new things. And if you're scared, just go ahead and do it, but do it scared but do it. So we learned a lot from each other, and you know, Wayne and Beverly, to me, go together. I can't talk about Wayne without Beverly. I love you, Beverly, and you've always been a great part of my sobriety, and you and Wayne both were a very, very bright part of my tapestry in life, and I'm, I'm very grateful for that. So, Wayne, I will miss you dearly, but I know you are always around, and I, you're going to keep your eye on Beverly, so don't worry about Beverly. We're all going to take care of her. I was thinking about all the trips we took overseas during our Texas shows. And Wayne did have an addiction. And I think most of you knew what it was. But yes, <laughs> we, were, we did a show at a museum in Shanghai, Houston Contemporary Works. And then we flew to Beijing. And Wayne said, what are we going to do in Beijing? I said, well, let's go see the Forbidden City. <laughs> Wayne says, yeah, let's do that. I mean, this was the Forbidden City. This was the, the last palace of the Chinese emperors. So we get there. Wayne's in the bus. He said, I need a coffee. He says, where's the Starbucks? Now, there's at least 25 of us on the bus. Somebody says, get a rope. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't find a Starbucks. So we, we arrive at the Forbidden City, go through those giant yellow gates, and lo and behold, we're going in, and Wayne's down and out because of no, no Starbucks. And we get there, and in the east corner of the palace grounds, guess what? There's a Starbucks. So God had chosen that moment <laughs> to take care of Wayne's addiction of caffeine. But it, it, it was amazing. And the Chinese government, of course, knew what was going on. They took it away after a while. But Wayne was one of the few Americans that ever went to Starbucks in, in, uh, in the Forbidden City. Next we have uh, Brandon Zach of, of uh, Glass Tire. Are you here? Come on up. I also have a little bit of a cheat sheet. Uh, thank you all for being here today, and I'm humbled and honored that Beverly asked me to stand up and say a few words about Wayne. Um, Wayne was one of the most singular people that I've ever met. So to try and stand up and say anything uh, about him or surmising his character in five minutes at a memorial seems like a fool's errand, but I'm going to try to do my best if you'll bear with me. Um, I'm gonna talk about Wayne, the artist, the gallerist, but also the person. So uh, the more I got to know Wayne, the more impressed I became with his sincerity. Um, he had this way about him of interacting with people uh, and a way about him of looking at and thinking about art and what it could do in the world. And I think his sincerity around art and his belief in everything that he did really stemmed from his belief in his true love of people as people. 
If you ever talked to Wayne at an opening or at his own gallery or wherever, he made you feel seen in a way that um, was just immensely genuine. And in a world that oftentimes has a lot of people who are focused on promoting their own initiatives or who are obviously for their own reasons looking out for themselves, this was one of the most refreshing and unique qualities about Wayne. Um, because this was who he was, it means that he centered other people in his own life. In everything he did, he removed himself from the spotlight and he was always focused on platforming others, uh, sometimes to his own detriment. But it was important enough to him that that's how he operated and he knew that if he could help other people achieve what they wanted to achieve, that he would benefit in the process and that all of us would benefit in the process. This is obviously seen in his gallery which operated for countless years and showed dozens of artists. Um, he trusted artists in a really unique way that not a lot of people do and he believed in their work and made them feel like full partners in whatever they were doing with him. He made their work feel worthy. He made their work feel seen. He also didn't censor or gatekeep them, which was one of the most refreshing things about him. Um, so because of that, his gallery, in addition to the other meeting places that it was, it became a meeting place for all of the artists who didn't really have a place to call home. Uh, it plus the Redwood Art Center just became this own little community within the heights, within the larger art community. But because of that, uh, and because Wayne was who he was, he still worked to bring everyone else there also. He believed in the dialogue that the community deserved. He believed that, he believed that people needed to interact with one another and needed to know what was happening. Uh, because of his work at the gallery and just bringing everyone together, he's a person that I think of as a scene maker. So basically, um, there's this pantheon of people who have helped make Houston the place it is now for art and for artists. And a lot of that work is behind the scenes and goes completely unacknowledged. Um, and part of it also is that you don't really realize how much someone is contributing until they're not around to contribute anymore. And I know this was, is, and will be the case with Wayne. Um, Wayne also always centered other people in his own art. Uh, as we all know, uh, his work was made using unclaimed cremated remains. Um, and his ultimate goal, as many people have said on this stage before me at this point, was dignifying people as people. Um, he believed that whoever someone was, they were worthy and their story was worthy of attention and of respect. And through no fault of his own, that message oftentimes got lost. Um, there was a lot of sensationalizing around Wayne's work. And that's never something I saw him lean into. Uh, whenever he talked about his art, he was always just ardently sincere. He was uh, sharp and he knew how his work was perceived, but he didn't let that stop the idea, the conceptual rigor, um, even though it was oftentimes lost in the conversation around it. He persisted because he believed that the work and the ideas would come out in the end. Uh, in many ways, I think Wayne was ahead of his time. Um, he was really an artist's artist. Uh, a lot of good art or groundbreaking art isn't easily digestible. It makes you uncomfortable and it makes you think. And Wayne's art did all of this and more. So I only hope it's a matter of time before we're able to cast off the preconceptions about it and uh, instead see Wayne's work how he did. And I know I'm also very much preaching to the choir. Uh, even though Wayne's no longer with us, um, I'm heartened that Beverly still is. Art doesn't happen in a vacuum, and similarly, people like Wayne are able to exist because of the loving support that they have behind them 
working with them and recharging them. Beverly was Wayne's behind the scene partner in crime and I know that in her own way she'll continue the legacy of what the two of them have been doing together for the past 30, 40 years. Uh, Houston's always changing as a city, that's kind of its hallmark and without Wayne it's not going to be the same place that it was. Even so, I'm grateful for all of the work Wayne put in to help make our city what it is today. You can't always get what you want, but you oftentimes get what you need. And Wayne was, our, Wayne was what our city needed, and I think we're all a little better for it. Thank you all. We have, we have another half hour or so. We have the space till four. Uh, we're going to open it up to sentiments from uh, you guys in the audience. So whoever would like to come up and keep it, keep it under a few minutes. Here's your sentiments. Lester, are you coming up? <laughs> I think we lost Lester. <laughs> so who would like to uh, say a few words? Give us your thoughts. Don't be shy. I know you guys aren't shy. <laughs> Lester, I thought you were coming up, but I didn't realize you were going in the alley. And um, that, that one sentence has really helped me um, more than anything other than a prescription for, <laughs> for a trazodone. <laughs> but <laughs> And then the, the, just the other thing I want to say is a few years ago, someone in my family came to me and uh, told me that uh, they were an alcoholic. Uh, the first thing I did is I said, I've got to get you with Wayne. And that happened. And um, that person is now clean and sober for two years. And um, it, it, what, what Wayne said to that person in my family, helped him more than you could ever know. And I just think Wayne was one of the most special, I could almost say the most special if Gus wasn't on stage with me. Just <laughs> one of the most special people that I've ever known and certainly in the art world, uh, there has never been anyone other than Gus. Like Wayne. Thank you. I'll pay you later. Lester, uh, I'm speaking for the whole crowd here. You, you are okay. Most of the time. <laughs> Thank you. Additional comments? And he was nude. And, um, <laughs> I think that's why he always was speeding in his black Lexus. He would try to make every opening in town. He wouldn't stay till the end, but you knew he was there for a while in his miscolored shoes or his Stetson hat. But he was, he was there. I'd come to maybe one opening, two openings a month, and I would say, was Wayne here? Yeah, he just left. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've heard that in my life. But he was very supportive. And he had, he had uh, it'd be interesting to see what effect he had on a lot of our younger artists. My name is Fran Linton, and there are several of us here today that went to high school and junior high with him. We probably know things about 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 him. We probably know things
Austin. He was never to be an artist when we knew. I don't, I don't even know if he ever said what he was going to be. I don't think he ever invented it.
that was just about canceled because the people at where it was shown were so offended by the <laughs> Anyway, I just wanted to tell you about that. <laughs> And I was worried she wouldn't talk. <laughs> but the problem is shutting me up when I get started. <laughs> we, we do have a hook in the back. <laughs> oh, I don't. No, I don't. Can, am I talking about it? So, I just want to thank everyone here who came out today. And I want to thank all of the people who have helped me so much, who have kept me alive in the last few months. And... Um, I just, uh, I have never felt so much love, and I really don't even know what to say about it, except thank you so much, and I love all of you, and I'm glad you're here. Before I close, I have some good news. When Tanya Peterson curated Wayne's last solo at Red Bud, which did quite well, and a lot of you attended, that's why we're here today, because we couldn't hold the capacity. We, we talked to Wayne about his legacy. And what's going to happen when we're all gone? What's going to happen to Wayne's art in the future? And we came up with the idea to see if we can get a museum to accept one of Wayne's pieces. So, so we, asked, we asked Wayne, he said, hey Wayne, you want Red Bud to try to get you into a museum collection? He says, no. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants this stuff. <laughs> so I waited half an hour. <laughs> Came back around. Yeah. Who are you thinking of? <laughs> and I said, What are we talking about? <laughs> we did this all the time. He said, Well, uh, how about the Manil? I said, Yeah, that's a possibility, but you know, I won't live to see that. We don't have the five years required to get that through the committees. So. You're saying that you actually want to be in a museum collection because we're talking about your legacy and the artwork. Because the rest of the legacy you know, is going to pass when we pass. He said, well, nobody wants it. I said, well, let us try. So we, we, uh, we submitted a, one of his, I consider his masterworks, Stars and Stripes Forever, the flag piece, which some of you are familiar with. Tanya, Tanya contacted the museum. You have interest? Yes. They accepted the, the committee. You have to go through a committee. The committee accepted it. We turned it in as mixed media. <laughs> <coughs> Curator calls me. <coughs> What's in this mixed media? type materials. <laughs> he said, you're shit me. <laughs> I know what's in this big <laughs> video. He do. And so I want to announce that we have the first uh, acquisition by a museum of Wayne Gilbert's work, the flag piece, by the Ogden Museum of Southern Art in New Orleans, Louisiana. <laughs> Tanya and I and Sharon, we were very happy. And so it's the start, the start of remembering his legacy. Because one way to do that is to get into museum collections. <laughs> Again, guys, thank you so much. Mill around, eat cookies, drink water, tea, whatever we have. No alcohol. <laughs> and and uh, I want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts, the committee, Gail, Sharon, and Tanya, and the rest of you that worked on this, probably. Uh, thank you guys so much for spending uh, this wonderful afternoon with us. 
at the, at the historic Heights Theater. And it's probably one of the best film matinees we ever had here in the history, the 90 year history of this theater. So thank you all. Mill around. Have fun.